Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Buccino, and it's a pleasure to mix my personal life and my professional life a little bit today. I'm honored to support my team here at Diabetes Canada who are bringing this amazing event to you. Um, in addition, on a personal note, I've lived with type 1 diabetes for over 35 years. I was diagnosed as a teenager and once having jumped that hurdle of learning all about diabetes and diabetes management in the late 1980s, I became very quickly fascinated with the role of nutrition. It truly is a cornerstone of diabetes management. Because of my diagnosis and emerging fascination with nutrition management, I went on to study nutrition and become a registered dietitian and worked in diabetes education early on in my career. After so many years, personally and professionally, some might say I'm a bit of an expert as a person with diabetes and maybe as a dietitian as well, but I'm always learning and today is no exception. It's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Desiree Nielsen, who will be making, walking us through inflammation, diet, and diabetes. Desiree is a registered dietitian with a focus on plant-based nutrition and digestive health. She's the author of two Canadian best-selling plant-based cookbooks, Eat More Plants and Good for Your Gut, as well as the host of an evidence-informed wellness podcast, The All Sorts Podcast. She lives in Vancouver, where she owns a private practice with a non-diet, weight-neutral approach to nutrition and health. Desiree is a mom of two and a sometimes neglectful gardener. Over to you, Desiree. Hello, everyone. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Desiree Nielsen. I am a registered dietitian coming at you from my kitchen here in East Vancouver. And I am so excited to share this presentation with you all because I got my start as a dietitian working in chronic inflammatory disease. And so chronic inflammation and the role that diet and lifestyle have to play have always been a big clinical interest of mine, but also a part of my practice. So today we're going to shift that lens to diabetes and take a look at how chronic inflammation has a role in both type one and type two diabetes, but also how diet plays into that. So that's me. I'm Desiree. Like I said, I've been a dietitian for over 15 years now, always here on the West Coast. I have had a private practice for over a decade now where we focus on chronic inflammatory and digestive concerns. And of course, plant-based eating because I'm a plant-based person. I have a couple of cookbooks, which I'm, there we go, covering up right now, Eat More Plants, which came out in 2019 and Good for Your Gut, which came out in 2021. And then I even have a new book called Plant Magic coming out in April of next year. One of the reasons why the cookbooks are so important to me is that I realized very early on as a dietitian is that I can provide nutritional information and education, but you still have to go home and figure out what to make for dinner for yourself and your family. And so if I can create delicious, easy to prepare recipes with nutrition in mind, then you can exhale, just follow the recipe and know that you're feeding yourself and your family something really nutrient dense. I also have the following disclosures. So as a dietitian in private practice who does social media, I have worked with multiple food and supplement companies as a spokesperson or as a collaborator on social media on an ongoing basis. I'm also the author of books on nutrition and inflammation. And I have received a speaker's fee from Diabetes Canada for this learning activity. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Beyond the high anti-inflammatory, I have to say, you know, part of me has gotten away from talking about anti-inflammatory nutrition a little bit on my social media feeds because it's become such a buzzword and so filled with pseudoscience and misinformation that I want to ensure that I'm not helping to perpetuate any of these myths. So today is going to be a lot about myth busting. What is inflammation? How is it connected to diabetes? What's the actual science behind nutrition's connection to inflammation? Plus, of course, a lot of wacky internet myths to ignore and some very simple, practical ways to make change. We're not just going to talk theory today. This is news you can use, things that you can take home in your life today to help start to make changes. And then we'll talk about the opportunity for Q&A. So what's this inflammation thing we're talking about? <laughs> the first thing you need to know is that inflammation is not always a bad thing. When we talk specifically about anti-inflammatory nutrition, we immediately think that inflammation is somehow 
awful and never a good thing. We want to eradicate it whenever possible. The first thing you need to know is that it is impossible to eliminate inflammation. And that's a very good thing because inflammation is a normal response of your immune system. When there is damage in the body, the immune system turns on inflammation, but there's acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. And you can kind of think of acute inflammation like your body's paramedics. Great example is that if you're cooking in the kitchen and you accidentally cut yourself with a knife, that redness, that heat, that swelling you feel and you see is inflammation. That is acute inflammation rushing to the area to engulf any bacteria that might've been on your skin surface or on the knife to help to send all of the, you know, little chemicals and messengers that your body needs to start to like sew up and mop up that cut. Inflammation is a great thing. When the threat is present, it turns on. And when the threat is not present, it turns off. That's when it's acute. That's when it's helpful. Chronic inflammation is a little different. It's actually a very different pathway. And chronic inflammation is more like the bull in the china shop. So it goes around and makes a lot of noise. It breaks a lot of stuff and it ends up causing more damage than help. That's what we want to try and moderate. That's what we want to try and focus our diet and lifestyle activities to help to calm chronic inflammation. And we'll talk about why this is important in a minute. So what causes chronic inflammation? If I talked about inflammation as being a response to damage, it doesn't just happen out of nowhere. The immune system is efficient. It's not going to turn on if you don't need it, right? So there's gotta be some sort of damage that the body is attempting to respond to with inflammation. And this can be increased body fat, particularly around the midsection, stress, we greatly underestimate the effect of stress in our lives and the damaging effect that it can have on our long-term health. Our gut bacteria also play a role. We'll talk a lot more about that in this presentation. Gut barrier dysfunction, which you might've seen on the internet as quote unquote leaky gut, which sounds like a made up internet thing. It's actually legit. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it is and how it impacts inflammation later. Certain disease states like diabetes, can influence inflammatory states as well as dietary pressures, what you are or are not eating, and then inactivity. So as you can see, as much as I am a dietitian, and I would love to say, if you eat a certain way, it will be 100% taken care of by nutrition. That's not the case. Most of the chronic diseases we experience, most of the chronic conditions, including inflammation that we experience, are multifactorial. We have to take a holistic view. We have to think about our stress. We have to think about our sleep. We have to think about how we move or don't move our bodies as well as what we're eating. So what is the connection between diabetes and inflammation? And does inflammation even play a role in diabetes? We actually see this in the literature, both in type two and in type one diabetes. So we know that the presence of chronic inflammation plays a role in the onset and progression of type two diabetes. And we also observe in type two diabetes, a chronic low grade inflammation in both the fat and muscle cells, as well as in the liver and the pancreas. And we know that having this oxidative stress and inflammation in diabetes contributes to future risk factors such as heart disease, as well as impaired wound healing and nerve damage. But what about type one? We actually know that inflammatory cells are involved in the original destruction of pancreatic beta cells and that the autoimmune process, remember when I talked about the immune system being efficient and it's not going to turn on or attack if it doesn't need to? Well, in autoimmunity, there is there is a little bit of a breakdown of appropriate immune response. And so we see this autoimmune process in diabetes contributing to chronic inflammation. In addition, lifestyle derived inflammation. So if you have type one diabetes and through all of those factors we talked about before, dietary pressures, inactivity, stress, lack of sleep, that can increase insulin resistance, which can make your insulin therapy more challenging. So we have to talk about blood sugars and inflammation, and we're going to cover this a little bit in the myths section, but I want to get into it in a foundational way here, 
because there is so much misinformation about the role that blood sugars play in chronic inflammation. So we have to state off the top that yes, chronic hyperglycemia, so chronic high blood sugars is an inflammatory state, which is just one more reason why getting our blood sugars under control and hitting our targets with diabetes is so, so important. And when it comes to what plays into rise of blood sugars, right? If we didn't eat, our blood sugars wouldn't rise. That wouldn't be a very good idea. So the foods we eat do impact our blood sugars. We know this when we have diabetes. And that means being mindful of the glycemic load of foods versus glycemic index. And we're going to talk about that distinction later on in the, in the what to eat section, but being mindful of a glycemic load is a good idea. However, and this is a big, however, it's very incorrect to label higher glycemic index foods as inflammatory. And I see this, I see influencers on social media talking about how oats are not a healthful food, which could not be further from the truth and further from decades of science. We need to ensure that we don't connect any rise of blood sugar with inflammation. Yes, we want to be mindful of glycemic load, but just because your blood sugars rise at all doesn't mean you're stoking the fires of chronic inflammation. And just like how we eat and our diabetes can influence inflammation, influ chronic inf inflammation can influence our diabetes and how we respond to the foods we eat and our blood sugars, because we know that chronic inflammation affects how the body regulates blood sugar response. So when there is a lot of chronic inflammation in the body, it actually decreases the insulin sensitivity in our cells, which means we're going to be more insulin resistant. We're gonna have a harder time managing our blood sugars. What's more, it also impairs the release of insulin in the pancreas. So not only are we having difficulty getting the insulin out of the pancreas and into the bloodstream, but then our tissues and our cells are less responsive. And I know that this can seem now like a catch 22 because if you have diabetes and your blood sugars are higher, that's stoking chronic inflammation. But if you have chronic inflammation, that's making it harder to control your blood sugars is this a zero sum game? It's not. Just because we see that this is true, we need to know two things. One, that controlling our blood sugars is not as cut and dried as the internet would like you to believe. This is really important because I think we see this very biased, unscientific information that can cause us to blame ourselves when we're having difficulty getting our sugars under control, but know that there's so much going on clinically that makes that challenging. But the second thing that's really important is knowing that, hey, if we know what contributes to chronic inflammation and we know that lowering chronic inflammation would be really good for our diabetes and really good for balancing our blood sugars, then hopefully that motivates us to make some changes because we know that as we move towards these changes, that's only gonna be a benefit for our body. So let's talk diabetes and let's take a little detour into our ascending colon where trillions of bacteria live. This is an incredible thing. You know, we were, we were, you know, so, so taught to be scared of germs and bacteria, but you and bacteria are co-collaborators in your life and in your health. And the trillions of bacteria living in your digestive tract transform the undigested fibers from plant foods like fruits and vegetables and legumes into helpful compounds called short chain fatty acids. They're exactly like they sound, they're tiny little fats and they have a whole bunch of benefits. Bacteria also contribute to the health of your digestive barrier. So when we talked about that leaky gut and how leaky gut can influence chronic inflammation, one of the things you have to realize is that your digestive tract, even though you think it's inside of you because you don't see it, is actually from entrance on through exit continuous with the outside world. So to your body, your gut 
is the outside world. And so that barrier between you and the outside world, AKA your gut is as critical for keeping you well and keeping your immune system calm as your skin is. Think about it. When you cut yourself in the kitchen, inflammation comes to play because that skin barrier is compromised. When the digestive barrier is compromised, that can also increase chronic inflammation. So having good gut bacteria to help protect the gut and keep that barrier strong is super, super important. What's more, we see that both in type one diabetes and type two diabetes, we do see in the literature patterns uh, that are different from people without diabetes and they tend to be enriched in types of bacteria that sort of stoke the fires of inflammation a little bit more than we would like to see. And one of the reasons for that is that some of these bacteria have molecules on their coat, on the outer coat of their cells. So bacteria sort of have a skin just like we do. And these molecules called LPS or lipopolysaccharides are associated with inflammation and insulin resistance in type two diabetes. And they may contribute to type one diabetes as well. And we also see in the research, those short chain fatty acids, when we have lower levels of them, because we don't have enough of the good bacteria that make them, when we have low levels of short chain fatty acids, we tends to be associated with poor health outcomes. So now that we know what inflammation is and what contributes to it, let's zero in on the thing that I know best, which is nutrition, the science of how nutrition impacts inflammation. And we're gonna start with some hard truths here because what we think anti-inflammatory nutrition is, is very different from what it actually is. You start scrolling on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and you look up, you know, influencers talking about inflammation. You're going to see all sorts of things like gluten is inflammatory or fruit is high in sugar and it's inflammatory and they are 100% wrong. So let's get into it. What is anti-inflammatory, if it's not that, what is anti-inflammatory nutrition? The one thing that you need to realize is that no one food or one meal will cause or correct chronic inflammation. When we have diabetes, therapeutic nutrition is going to cover two bases. First, to help improve blood sugars and get them into targets. And then the second is the positive, like, your body isn't made and your health isn't made by what you do not eat. You have biological requirements for, you know, nutrients like iron to, to build red blood cells and B vitamins to help you harness the energy from food. Part in addition to keeping blood sugars under control, another piece of therapeutic nutrition is helping to provide the nutrients you need for your overall health and nutrients that can help to lessen inflammation. And so we're always talking about pattern over plate. It's something I'm fond of saying, which means it's not about one food. It's not about one meal. It's about the overall pattern day in, day out, weeks after months, after years. And that pattern is rich in whole plant foods. This is not that about dietary labels. This isn't about being a carnivore or a vegan. This is about however works best for you, eating a high plant food diet, which is lower in hyper-processed. So the ultra-processed foods, like the snack foods, those kind of things. I'm not talking about a can of beans, but we're talking about more the snacks and the fast foods and then lower in animal foods, however makes sense for your life. And there is also no one anti-inflammatory diet. So if you're like, oh, give me a list of like, what is exactly the foods on an anti-inflammatory diet? We actually don't have data to say, this is it. Eat this and only this. What we do have is other dietary patterns like the Mediterranean diet that have been also studied for their positive impact on inflammation. Um, and we do have a little bit of data from my world of digestive disease, but nothing that's gold standard yet. And so again, pattern over plate, we know that an anti-inflammatory diet is about being nutrient dense versus energy dense. So we don't need 
food with lots of calories, but not a lot of nutrition. We need whole plant foods that are rich in nutrients without a ton of energy. And it's totally in line with basic healthy eating guidelines. So this is not information that's going to look new. This is lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes. We want to choose other things in moderation. So this isn't a ban. This isn't elimination. This is fewer hyper-processed foods, less red meat, less high fat dairy. Generally speaking, this is something we can all sort of get behind no matter how we like to eat. So let's get into the nitty gritty. Now that I've said, you're like, yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, pattern over plate. Let's just like eat all the nice things. What's the science actually say? Let's get into specifics. I always start with fats because fats are almost never a part of this inflammation question unless we're talking about omega-3s and omega-6s. Most of our energy goes there. It should go somewhere different. If you look on the internet, what we're gonna think causes inflammation is seed oils. We're gonna talk about why that's not true later on in the presentation. What actually contributes to inflammation is too much fat in general, particularly saturated fats, which come from red meat, tropical oils like coconut and palm, and high fat dairy. When it comes to sugars, again, people say sugar is inflammatory. Anything that turns into sugar, like grains, like fruit, is inflammatory. No, no, no. What actually causes inflammation is, a, again, a pattern. This isn't your, you know, birthday cake in a week of generally nutrient-dense eating. This is a pattern of hyper-processed carbs. So when most of the foods you consume are conveniences, are really carb-rich or fast foods, and excess added sugars, that's a pattern that's going to contribute more to inflammation. It's not about one food. Something else that we generally don't talk about with respect to inflammation is fiber. And we know that low fiber diets are associated with increased inflammation. And most of us in North America are consuming what would be described as a low fiber diet. The average intake of fiber in North America is about 15 grams a day, whereas the evidence suggests that we should be consuming between 25 and 38 grams a day if we're under 50 years of age. We need our diet to be high in fiber as well as high in fermentable carbohydrates to feed the beneficial bacteria. We talked about why bacteria are important. This is why. One of the reasons why fiber and whole plant foods are so important is because when we feed beneficial bacteria, those beneficial bacteria keep our digestive tract strong. They make those short chain fatty acids and all of this starts to make a little bit more sense. And then finally, phytochemicals. So when we eat whole plant foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, um, whole grains, there we go, I got them all. They all contain naturally occurring compounds that have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory actions. And this isn't about extracting something and putting it in a pill because generally those things don't work very well. But when we are consuming, again, a pattern of foods that are high in these phytochemicals, all of those little positive influences add up to help us lessen inflammation. So this is probably the time where we should talk about added sugars versus natural sugars, because I know there's a lot of confusion here. It is very important for you to know that even in diabetes, there is no guideline or recommendation for limiting the naturally occurring sugars in fruits and vegetables. None, none whatsoever. However, there are very solid guidelines and very solid evidence for reducing added sugars. What's an added sugar? It's not what you might expect. This includes things like fruit juice concentrates, honey, maple syrup, coconut sugar. I see as a dietitian, but also as a recipe developer, I see online so often, oh, here, eat my healthy cookies. They're not made with refined sugar, but instead they have two cups of coconut sugar. Well, two cups of coconut sugar versus two cups of cane sugar, it's the same thing, right? As a dietitian, I want to see you consume fewer added sugars in total. And Diabetes Canada recommends no more than 10% of calories from added sugars over the course of your day. 
And another recommendation that I love because I don't typically um, promote calorie counting in my own practice is a, a hard sort of like teaspoon or gram limit on sugars. So the American Heart Association recommends no more than nine teaspoons daily, or if you're looking at nutrition facts panels, 36 grams of sugars for larger, more active bodies, which we typically describe as men, and then six teaspoons daily or 24 grams of added sugars for smaller, less active bodies or women. <clears throat> and as I sort of alluded to before, how we eat is not just about providing nutrients for our bodies, how we eat also impacts the bacteria living in your gut. And there's this saying, you are what you eat, right? So you are what you eat, you digest, you absorb it into your bloodstream, but we only digest and absorb between 80 to 95% of all the food and drinks we consume. What happens to that five to 20%? It travels through your digestive tract and anything that travels through your digestive tract gets exposed to your gut bacteria. And anything your gut bacteria get exposed to, they can be transformed by it. They're either going to eat it or not eat it. And that will determine which kind of bacteria want to call you home. We talked about how those bacteria are so important for the health of your digestive barrier, but also how your nervous system and immune system, remember immune system is inflammation, how both of those systems function. And so when we talked about fat and we talked about how most people are concerned with omega threes and omega sixes. And we're going to clarify that later, but why we should be more concerned with saturated fat, which nobody talks about with respect to inflammation. Here's one of the reasons why this can be an issue. High saturated fat diets can increase LPS in circulation. Remember how we talked about that LPS, those lipopolysaccharides that can be on the outer skin of bacteria and how those can stoke inflammation, consuming high saturate. So lots of high fat dairy, lots of red meat, lots of hyper-processed foods, high in saturated fat. They can increase the amount of the LPS that gets into your bloodstream. And when that happens, the body recognizes that as foreign and it attacks it with inflammation. So the thing that you need to know, cause there's a lot of science here and I like to share the science because I think when we understand the why we're more motivated for the what I could say, just eat your fruits and vegetables. I mean, is that new? When was the last time you heard a dietitian tell you to eat your fruits and vegetables, right? But when you see, oh, the fruits and vegetables contain fiber. They also contain fermentable carbohydrates. Those feed the bacteria those keep my digestive system strong and keep inflammation at bay in the immune system, then you start to see how this all comes together. So what do you actually need to remember here? You want to eat the food that feeds the kind of bacteria you want more of in your gut and good bugs like plants, high fiber, high in fermentable carbohydrates, AKA the stuff that makes you gassy. It's true. A little bit of gas is totally normal and a very good thing. So yes, I want to close this by saying, yes, Canadians generally do eat too many added sugars, but no, sugar is not toxic or inflammatory. Like I said before, a teaspoon of sugar in your salad dressing to make your salad super delicious. So you want to eat more salad. That's a very good thing. It doesn't work like a magic eraser to take away all the health benefits. So let's get into myths now like the no carb diet. <laughs> That's me walking away. <laughs> and this very unpopular fact, but this is fact based in decades of science, our blood sugars are supposed to rise. It was how we were biologically designed. And so we get into a little bit of tricky territory when we have diabetes, because yes, our blood sugars are meant to rise, but if our blood sugars rise too much, if we are insulin resistant, if we are chronically high blood sugar, that's also an inflammatory state that increases our risk of side effects, things like cardiovascular disease or nerve damage later on. So what's the sweet spot for us? And how do we determine the foods we need to stay in that sweet spot? One of the tools that has been 
given to us in the research is glycemic index and glycemic load. And I've seen this being co-opted on the internet to provide a lot of misleading advice and incorrect advice. And so let's get into it. What is the GI or glycemic index? It measures the blood sugar rise over time for a given food. And so the GI of a food is always for a reference amount. So it's the same weight of food. And then you go over time, right? So like one hour or two hours and a high GI food is going to cause blood sugars to rise up really fast and then to crash in theory. And that's the important point here. And low GI carbs are gonna give you a little sustained bump. So it makes sense. Okay, low GI we probably want and high GI we probably don't want, right? Except the problem with high GI versus what is known as glycemic load which measures the actual glycemic impact of a food is that there are foods that are high GI that don't actually raise your blood sugars a lot. Things like carrots or watermelon. And the reason for that is that the glycemic load measures the potential of the food to raise your blood sugars, like the glycemic index, against how many carbohydrates are actually in that serving. So yes, if you ate like a whole, like a couple of pounds of carrots or watermelon, that's going to be a high GI and a lot of carbohydrate. And that would actually increase your blood sugars quite a bit. But most of us eat just a little bit. And that little bit doesn't actually have a lot of carbohydrate. So it doesn't actually raise our blood sugars that much. And low GI slash low glycemic load nutrition is evidence-based in diabetes. However, we also need to consider the total dietary effect because we generally don't eat foods in isolation except for maybe a random apple or a small handful of carrots. The other thing we need to think about is the hacks you see on the internet are probably not what you wanna follow. In addition to people who are talking about blood sugars rising as always being a bad thing, remember your blood sugars were meant to rise, alongside it is, well, blood sugars are spiking, spiking causes diabetes, it doesn't. And here's a hack to make sure that doesn't happen, right? They invent a problem, they freak you out about it, and then they give you a solution that is theirs and uniquely theirs. And one of the hacks that's going around is drinking apple cider vinegar, AKA ACV. And it's become a popular internet hack. The idea that you drink uh, some apple cider vinegar before a meal to lower your blood sugars. In reality, acid is, there's always, there's always a kernel of truth here. Acid is one of four factors that helps to lower the glycemic impact of a meal. The factors are acid, but also protein, fiber, and fat. So when we build a meal, we add some protein, maybe a little bit of chicken, maybe a little bit of lentils. We have fiber from whole grains or vegetables. We add a little bit of fat. Maybe it's a little bit of cooking oil or some avocado or some nuts. And then, yeah, absolutely. We can add some acid, some fruits have high acidity, but we can also add lemon juice or a little bit of vinegar sounds like a really delicious salad to me, doesn't it to you? We, in the process of making a balanced meal, can consider all four factors and you never have to choke down an actual shot of apple cider vinegar, which in all honesty is also associated with some very real dangers. Not only is it really bad for your tooth enamel, but it can also burn your esophagus. And what the influencers don't tell you as they are sharing all of the success stories of their hacks, they don't tell you about the people who have been harmed by it. And that's a very real concern when you're consuming information on the internet. So you need to know, not only do you not need to choke down something that doesn't taste that delicious, it's also not very safe for you. The other one that's quite pervasive in this camp of 
blood sugars rise is always bad are grains causing inflammation. So one, the blood sugars we talk about, but two, there's a lot of misinformation about things like gluten, which is found in wheat, barley, and rye, or lectins, which is found, which are found in many plant foods. It is incorrect, categorically unscientific and non-evidence-based that gluten causes inflammation in anyone except for those with celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease that has a gluten trigger. And when we look at grains, grains are not all the same thing. There are hyper-processed refined grain products, which absolutely have a high glycemic index and a high glycemic load. And we have grains in their most natural state, which is whole. We're talking about the quinoa, the millet, the whole wheat bread, the whole wheat pasta, whole grains, have a very different impact on our blood sugars than hyperprocessed and refined grains. So we need to know that whole grains are absolutely associated in decades of research with a lower risk of chronic disease and decreased inflammation because high fiber foods like whole grains feed the microbiome. High fiber whole grains help moderate, you know, that nice little sustained bump in blood sugar high fiber grains help produce that. And high fiber whole grains are generally more nutrient dense. They are also much richer in protein than we realize another factor that moderates blood sugars. They contain tons of B vitamins and minerals like iron and zinc, again, to help support our metabolism so that it responds appropriately to the foods we eat. And nope, I told you I was coming back to this one. Seed oils do not cause inflammation. 15 years ago, when I got my start as a dietitian, we were on about this seed oil thing. And I have to admit that myself, based on the evidence at the time, was convinced that consuming more omega-6 fatty acids, which we find not just in seed oils, but in meat, as well as whole grains and almost all nuts and seeds, were potentially pro-inflammatory. 15 years later, we have so much more evidence to confirm not only our omega-6 fats and the foods that they contain them, like seed oils, not only are they not inflammatory, we have data to show that omega-6 rich oils like sunflower seed oil and canola oil are actually anti-inflammatory, particularly when we replace hyper-processed, refined, high GI carbohydrate foods or saturated fats with omega-6 oils. And this is really important because there is an enormous amount of wellness elitism that constantly finds fault with foods that are affordable and available to all like sunflower and canola oils. If you can't afford avocado oil or you can't afford olive oil, these foods are absolutely affordable and will not contribute to inflammation. So we can all exhale, breathe a sigh of relief and know that we're doing a good thing for our bodies. So let's talk about now that we've sort of like gone through the theory, we've seen the science, we've talked about some myths. What can you actually do in your diet today and on an ongoing basis to help lessen chronic inflammation? Let's get into it. The first thing you need to know is that there are very few rules in nutrition. Good nutrition is 100% individualized. So even everything that I say here, although it is evidence-based may or may not be right for you. A classic example, I encourage people to consume a lot of nuts and seeds because they're very nutritious. But what if you have a peanut allergy? That's the individualization. Peanuts are not right for you because you have an allergy, but perhaps you can consume almonds or perhaps you can consume pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds. It's really important to get individualized advice whenever we can, because that's what gonna be what's best suited for you. Now, having said that, there are a couple of global rules that are always correct. Always, always, always. Things like drink water, for example. And the first, and most important rule, which I've already mentioned a couple of times in this presentation is pattern over plate. And this is the kind of plate to make your pattern most often. Again, it's about most of the time, not about 
hard, rigid rules that we have to adhere to 24-7, 365. And this, again, seems like such a dietitian-y thing that it must not be effective or powerful, but it's deeply evidence-based. This is what we call the plate method. No counting calories, no counting grams of anything. If you can adhere to the plate method most often, it is the most profound way to help you balance your blood sugars and ensure that your meals are nutritionally balanced. Half your plate fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate proteins, and a quarter of your plate whole grains and starchy vegetables, and then a little dot there because you wanna have a little bit of fat in there to help moderate blood sugars and improve flavor of the meal and improve fat soluble nutrient absorption. When you do this, it's not about never eating a high GI food. It's not about any other rules and nutrition, good foods, bad foods. It's about creating a better energy balance, more nutrient dense versus energy dense, getting that protein, fiber, and fat in there for blood sugar balance and providing adequate nutrition. And the second rule of nutrition, just eat more plants. We get into this, well, I eat this way and I eat that way. And this is me and that's you. No matter how you eat, really, you don't got to put a label on it. Wherever you are on the spectrum of plant-based eating, just shift towards more plants. It is so profound in terms of increasing nutrient density, increasing fiber, increasing fermentable carbohydrates. And it's important to not get this one twisted because one of the biggest challenges after 15 years of counseling people in nutrition is that one of the biggest challenges we face in making personal nutrition choices is something called nutritionism. And this is the idea that we get caught up in the minutia of this nutrient or that nutrient or this good food or this bad food, and we lose the forest for the trees. We abandon these kind of boring, traditional, but evidence-based habits and strategies like the plate method or like eating more plants for the shiny hack, right? So instead of saying, oh, I'm going to use the plate method, I'm going to consume my oats with some frozen berries, which are high in fiber, that's increasing my fruit and vegetable. I'm going to add some healthy fat in the form of peanut butter or maybe some ground flax that will also increase fiber to balance my blood sugars. Instead, we look on the internet and someone says, oh, I don't like oats because they're carbs and they make your blood sugar spike. No, that's not the case. Stick to the tried and true and don't get caught up in that minutia. The other thing that I see in private practice is that we tend to, you know, we can have these conversation. What is the rule? Eat more whole plant foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains. And then I get questions. They're saying, okay, so tell me about the breakfast cereal that I should eat. Which one has the most fiber? Tell me which cracker is healthier. Tell me which granola bar is healthier. Um, tell me which like packaged side dish is healthier. And do you see what's happening here? Absolutely. These foods can play a role in our life. They're convenient and they can be nutritious. And I'm not saying we don't eat them, but we forget about the, oh, I could just eat an apple right now with a little bit of peanut butter, but I look for the, you know, the granola bar instead, or, well, I could just, you know, buy this salad kit and like have these ready-made vegetables and have a nice salad on the side. Instead, you're like, okay, so what sort of like side package side dish should I buy? Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains in their whole form as much as possible. These are not, they don't have any fancy marketing on the package to continue to remind you how good for you they are. And we tend to get really caught up in marketing and a shiny package that says high in fiber or high in protein, but we forget that the whole foods are where it's at. And that's the foundation of a nutritious diet. So let's talk about fiber a little more because fiber is considered a protective factor in type two diabetes. And there are also many different fibers with plant foods, which again, if you're like, okay, so 
what fiber supplement should I take or which fiber enriched cracker should I consume? We want to get our fiber ideally from a variety of whole plant foods because there are so many different fibers with so many different activities. Some sweep the gut clear, keep you moving. Some help bind stuff like cholesterol to help you remove it from the body and flush it out. Some feed your gut bacteria, some keep you full and satisfied and your blood sugar is more stable. So if we're just trying to get that from a single isolated supplement, we're going to lose all of the other benefits of a variety of fiber. So we want to think of whole foods first and foremost, and then a variety of whole foods. <clears throat> and what does a high fiber day actually look like? It's a lot simpler than you think. So I wanted to give this option, you know, like a very simple breakfast, two pieces of spread of grain bread with peanut butter and sliced apple. That doesn't look like an unusual breakfast, right? Pretty normal, so, uh, you know, a higher fiber bread is going to get you there or a lunch, a nice sweet potato with lentil and spinach salad. Again, as a snack, instead of like a granola bar thing, just grab a little handful of almonds, super high protein, fiber, vitamins, really nutrient dense, going to keep your blood sugars balanced. And then like an easy chicken curry with some brown rice and some frozen broccoli. Because again, when it comes to, I talked a little bit about affordability, frozen fruits and vegetables are incredible. And we live in a Northern country where not everything is in season all year round. Frozen is a very great nutritious option that is often more affordable than fresh. And I want you to embrace that. The other thing to embrace and really helps with respect to variety is eat in season because when things are in season, they are more abundant and the price is lower. So you know, we don't eat strawberries in January because they're too expensive, for example. And like in the cooler months, that's when we're looking at root vegetables, like rutabagas and sweet potatoes and celery root, like all these things our grannies used to prepare. We need to get back into them. They're incredibly nutrient dense. They're very affordable, though locally grown, like it's a win-win all around. The other thing we want to talk about in terms of making choices, we want to watch saturated fat, we want to watch excess added sugars and salt. So we talked about this already. So this is really about um, eating less fried food, less butter, less cheese, fewer high fat red meats, and keeping sugar sweetened beverages, uh, what like, to a minimum, if at all, watching your baked goods, watching packets, Patch, pack, <laughs> package snacks. Sometimes you just get tongue tied after half an hour and keeping your desserts moderate. This isn't about saying no forever. Remember pattern over plate. And then of course, extra credit. I mentioned this once before and I'll reiterate it now. Food doesn't work like a magic eraser. No one food will lower inflammation without addressing the whole dietary pattern. But we do have some data on some particularly interesting foods that have anti-inflammatory activities. So if you want to include them as part of your whole plant food dietary pattern, it definitely couldn't hurt. The first category is flavonoid rich foods. Flavonoids are a type of phytochemical that we have quite a bit of research to support their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory nature. These are things like berries, coffee, yes, coffee, maybe without seven pounds of sugar and cream in it, but the coffee itself is not a harmful beverage. It's a bean extract, it's a plant food. Cocoa, green tea, onions, apples, all of those foods are rich in flavonoids. Spices and aromatics, things like turmeric, ginger, garlic, dried parsley are particularly high in phytochemicals, but honestly, get your spice drawer open and stop measuring in sprinkles, start measuring in spoons. Everything from cumin to cinnamon to chili powder, all spices and herbs are really beneficial. They also make healthy food taste incredible. So be heavy handed with your spices and herbs. <clears throat> and then yes, finally, we talk about omega-3. We sort of talked about the omega-6 piece of it and how we don't need to worry about omega-6s because we know that seed oils do contribute to anti-inflammatory diet patterns. But let's talk about omega-3s quickly. 
Omega-3 fatty acids are an essential fatty acids. When we say essential, that means we need to consume them. Our body doesn't make them. And there aren't a lot of foods that are high in omega-3 fats. It's essentially cold water, oily fish like salmon, mackerel, sardines, and seeds, such as hemp, flax, and chia. And so in the research now, we see that as long as you get enough omega-3 fatty acids, that appears to be much more important than avoiding omega-6 fats for maintaining that inflammatory balance, which is why I created something called the Daily Three. And I love this. It's just a really simple, positive nutrition strategy to help you get more nutrition into your day. My Daily Three are omega-3 rich seeds, green leafy vegetables, and beans and lentils. We already talked about why the omega-3 rich seeds are important try to get two to three tablespoons a day. Flax is the most cost effective of the bunch. If you buy whole flax, it's literally pennies a serving. And then you can grind it yourself in an old coffee grinder. And it's a wonderful way to uh, get omega-3s and some helpful fiber and minerals into your life. Green leafy vegetables, literally if it is green and leafy, everything from bok choy to arugula to broccoli, to dandelion greens, try and work your way up to two cups daily if you can. Frozen spinach is the absolute win here. Buy frozen spinach without any seasonings or sauces. If you've ever seen how much spinach wilts down into nothing, frozen spinach is the hack, a hack you can actually use because it's already sort of like pre-concentrated and really, really affordable then I would say you don't need two cups, but a half a cup of frozen spinach, maybe a cup if you're feeling saucy is an incredible nutrient dense addition to meals. And then beans and lentils, you know, many cultures, depending on your background already have like a really hearty reliance on beans and lentils. Others don't consume them at all. And I would like to encourage you to consume them. You want to start slow though. If you're new to beans and lentils, eat just a quarter cup a day because they're very strong fibers and fermentable carbohydrates. So you want to ensure that you let your digestive system adjust. And then you only increase your dose as your body uh, gets used to them. So here we go. What do you need to know? What's the news you can use? Chronic inflammation is a key feature in diabetes and it can make blood sugar regulation difficult, but how we eat can influence inflammation through blood sugar balance and immune supportive nutrients and feeding our good gut bacteria. Use the plate method and the daily three as your simple and evidence-based hacks for better nutrition and eat more whole nutrient dense plant foods. Rely on inexpensive stables like dried beans, rely on frozen vegetables. All of these things are incredibly nutritious and make it easier to eat well. And if you saw all that and you've got questions, well, I've got answers for you on November 18th for the live Q&A, so I hope you will join me. Thank you so much for taking this time out of your day to get nerdy about nutrition with me. I hope you've learned something new and interesting and helpful, and I look forward to seeing you at the live Q&A.